This is case 22, and it's a nice, easy example of seborrheic keratosis. Acanthotic, bland keratinocytes, beautiful horn pseudocysts, or some people call them pseudohorn cysts, um, and uh, with nice, uh, swirly, loose keratin in them, a flat bottom or uh, kind of string sign under the base, all the stuff. I've got other posts and videos about seborrheic keratosis. So why is this? Uh, seborrheic keratosis included here. Oh, you can see how it kind of overhangs the edge and kind of is stuck onto the skin. All the seborrheic keratosis stuff. Very nice. Well, there's a reason. Let me find it. Ah. Because in addition to the seborrheic keratosis, there is homogenized pink material with cracks in it in the dermis directly beneath. Right here, right here, and right here. And so I know that it's uh, kind of hard to see on this scan, but it's it's homogeneous pale pink crack artifact between it. This is amyloid, but this is very similar, a little bit bigger, but uh, uh, foci, but very similar to the amyloid we saw in the case of macular amyloidosis, macular amyloid earlier in the case. This is because this is the same kind of amyloid. It's keratin derived amyloid. It's got pink aggregates, cracks, and in the cracks it's hard to see because this scan's not really in focus. But there are uh, little. Um, uh, this is a melanophage, and here's another one. There are little uh, bits of melanin pigment that have dropped out of the basal keratinocytes along with the keratin and other proteins and uh, aggregated together here in the superficial dermis directly adjacent to the seb, and it's produced keratin amyloid. So it's a relatively common incidental finding. I see this present next to seborrheic keratoses, basal cell carcinomas, and other epithelial neoplasms, both benign and malignant. I see this, I don't know, uh, probably a weekly, multiple times a week, I would say. I, I When I see this, the reason that I'm point that bringing this up in this video is so that you recognize if you, if you encounter this, this does not mean anything clinically. This is a benign incidental finding that is not associated with amyloidosis, systemic amyloidosis. It is not associated with myeloma. It is not associated with AL or light chain type amyloid. This is keratin derived amyloid. It has all the features of amyloid that we discussed at length in, that you see in other keratin derived amyloid situations like macular amyloid of the upper back, lichen amyloidosis of the lower leg. And you can see that same keratin derived amyloid with the melanin. That is such a useful clue. The melanin pigment present in the cracks and the fact that the amyloid is right adjacent to the tumor here, right adjacent to the seborrheic keratosis. In a basal cell, it's going to be directly adjacent to the basal cell carcinoma. Here, it's, it's near this dermal papillary dermal vessel, but it's not actually in the wall of the vessel. It's in the dermis. This vessel is just trapped in the middle of it. If you go down deeper in the dermis and look elsewhere in the dermis, around other vessels in the dermis, around you know, deeper in nexal structures, you're not going to see any of that amyloid deposition, okay? If you saw that, that's when I would send it for mass spec to check, hey, could this be light chain that incidentally is depositing next to a seb or next to a basal cell? If you see amyloid here around these deeper dermal vessels or around eccrine coils, then you would think, oh, maybe this actually is a patient with systemic amyloidosis that just happened to be an incidental finding under a seb. I have seen that in a patient with a basal cell excision. They had deep dermal perivascular amyloid deposits. That is not keratin amyloid. That actually is the way light chain amyloid. And so I was uh, all excited that I had discovered, uh, incidentally discovered this patient's systemic amyloidosis. And then I looked up their history. They were being seen and were a known patient in the, the systemic amyloidosis and myeloma clinic. They already had known systemic amyloidosis and they were just seeing dermatology to get their basal cell carcinoma removed. So it was already a known finding in that patient's case. So that was totally different because the amyloid was deposited deep around the vessels, not next to the basal cell carcinoma. Here, all the deposits, look, here, 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 everywhere. The papillary dermis next to the tumor is filled with keratin amyloid. So this is a seborrheic keratosis with incidental keratin amyloid. When I encounter this, I personally do not mention this in my pathology report to minimize the chance that anyone might read that and get freaked out and think that the patient needs a bone marrow biopsy or an SPEP and UPEP or something else to rule out myeloma or systemic amyloid. I don't even go there because it doesn't mean anything. It's an incidental finding. The reason I teach about it is so that you as a pathologist recognize when you see this, yes, it's amyloid, but no, it is not light chain. It's keratin derived material. And it's just an incidental finding that sometimes we see with seborrheic keratoses and basal cells and other tumors. Oh, and look here, we're going to actually get a stain. That's really nice. And you know, earlier I mentioned in the macular amyloid uh, section, uh, 
you know, that there's different stains you can do for amyloids. So this stain is a stain that I have not used very often, but this is uh, a stain for amyloid uh, protein, for amyloid P. And I believe that it's actually an immunostain. I have actually tried it out a little bit um, and uh, found it to be a little difficult to interpret. I can't remember if this was the immuno or I think this is the immunostain. But there, there is an amyloid P um, antibody, an immunostain for amyloid. There's Congo Red. Some people use Crystal Violet. I have no experience with that. Um, my favorite is Thioflavin T, which will beautifully stain uh, amyloid, both uh, light chain amyloid, keratin drive amyloid, other amyloids. Bright green, uh, but you have to have an, uh, a fluorescent microscope to, to view it. So if you don't have a fluorescent scope, you're not going to be able to use Thioflavin T, but I find it to be a really uh, good stain. Uh, but here, this amyloid P looks really nice in this case. So maybe I should give it a try again. I, I've tried using it um, in a different setting, not for keratin amyloid, but it stains this beautifully. And um, uh, as I mentioned that, you know, some keratin immunostains will stain uh, some of, not all of the material, but it will stain focally within this material in keratin-dried amyloid, particularly uh, cytokeratin 903 tends to work really well for that. So you can try that out. Um, I've tried cytokeratin 5.6, which is another high molecular weight keratin, just like 903 is, and it didn't work as well. It did focally, but it wasn't as good. And I did, I did, I've tried pan cytokeratins like AE1, AE3, and I found them to not work well at all, in, in my hands at least, um, if, if for keratin drive the amyloids. So, so if you want to try a keratin stain, try 903. Um, if you have amyloid P in your lab, give it a go. But again, with H&E, uh, the, all the things I explained to you, I feel like this stain was done, you know, for teaching purposes here. This was not needed for diagnosis. Uh, this was just done for the study set. So beautiful example. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll give amyloid P another go. Uh, maybe I judged it too quickly.